the 56th Giro d'Italia, the Tour of Italy. The cycle race which this year has been extended for the first time to a semi-tour of Europe. 3,746 kilometers in 20 days. The Tour of Italy starts in Belgium. The procession sets off, stretching out for miles. Advertising caravans, press and television cars, police escort cars, race officials, radio intercommunication cars. And the field itself. 140 professional cyclists from many nations. Most of them are Italians, of course, but there are quite a number, too, of Belgians, Dutchmen, Spaniards, a couple of Frenchmen, some West Germans and Swiss, a Luxembourger, a Swede, and a Dane. Right behind the riders come the team cars, 28 of them two for each competing team, carrying coaches, mechanics, and masseurs. The ambulances and the pickup cars bring up the rear. The Tour of Italy has been held every year since 1909. It's the classical cycle race with a long and glorious roll call of legendary victories. Who can forget Fausto Coppi's row of victories? The winner in 1940, 47, 49, 52, and 53. In recent years, too, the Giro has seen some great winners. Take Gimondi, Max, Gimondi again, Max again, the Swede, Gosta Pettersson, and Max again. And now the 73 edition is off on the first lap here on the road through a corner of West Germany. Max in the pink team leader jersey has the situation under control. The lonesome Dane, Ole Ritter, number 18, has broken out together with number 2, Bruguier, and number 86, Lascano. But Bruguier, one of Max's men, seems to be holding back, and the Spaniard doesn't seem too interested in putting his heart into the breakaway. Ritter pushes forward again, and his lead is concentrated and forceful. He's determined to pull the others on, but they slug on reluctantly, not keen on sacrificing themselves. Ritter shortens the lead to keep the brake from petering out. He's taking a hard, long lead, but he's in bad company. It's a beautiful waste of energy. Each day has a specific agenda. The rendezvous, the start, the prize spurt, the mountain Grand Prix, the refreshment zone. On the second lap from Cologne to Luxembourg, the only Luxembourger, Gilson, has taken off on his own. And he gets his reward, first across the border. But Merx is losing his patience. And this is the way he exerts his tactical authority. La course en tête. Control the race by taking the lead. But Gilson has still enough in reserve to glue onto the rear wheel of this express train charging through his own country. From Strasbourg to Geneva, 
the riders are transported by charter flight. On the far side of these mountains, Italy is waiting for its marathon cycle race, its favorite summer event. Nearly all the riders are still running, but soon the real hardships will begin. The Alps will be the first sample of the mountain terrain that is to come. So far, the race hasn't been defined. There are only slight time differences between the leading riders. Bex is still ahead, Vitossi is number two, and De Vlamink is running third. As yet, none of the favorites has been left behind. Merx has not succeeded in placing himself more than one minute ahead of Fuente, the Spanish king of the mountains. But in a few days, the picture will be in much clearer focus. The new tour of Italy will have assumed a more definite shape. Here's the field before the ascent to the pass. Drawn out in a long, long queue because of the wind. Way up front, Bruyere is slogging away with Gimondi's Cavalcanti on his tail. Obviously, Merckx has given orders to speed it up. Then it's up and on to the top of the pass. This is the first time a cycle race has been routed through the Mont Blanc Tunnel, 11 kilometers long. All other traffic has been suspended for an hour or so. At last, Il Giro is on home ground and emerges on the sunny side of the Alps. The field free wheels down into La Bella Italia. passes with their eternal snow down into the town of Aosta. And the fertile Aosta Valley. A quiet time on the road. The rivals Merckx and Jamondi have a cosy chat together. Colleagues at leisure. Merck studies the lie of the land and the hardships of the days ahead. The geographic profile of the race. Now they're off on an eastern tack, this time with a side wind. With a side wind, fanning out affords the best cover. And the riders have to fight for their position in the fans. There is an understanding that each rider must take his turn on the windward side. From Bergamo, a trip up into the Trentine Hills, where thousands of Lombardians have gathered in honor of the event. Lombardy, the Trentines, and out to the Adriatic coast. Then back again into the country and up into the Apennines. The eighth lap from Lido by the Adriatic to the little mountain town of Carpegna in the Apennines is a lap which inspires awe in most of the riders. Jose Manuel Fuente studies the route. He feels the day holds possibilities because he's on home ground in the mountains. The steeper, the better. They say he'll attack today. But Max has taken his precautions he sent two of his strongest henchmen, Hoosmans and Schoenmacher, up to the front. And with them as locomotives, he'll control the rate of speed from the foothills. This means forcing the pace, and his opponents are not at all pleased. Here it's Felice Gimondi and Gosta Patterson. Hoosmans keeps up his forceful slogging pace in the lead. Schoenmacher glues onto his rear wheel, ready to take over when Hoosmans is exhausted. The boss himself is running third, 
with Roger Switz and his tail in reserve. Behind this awesome Flemish phalanx, the field is panicking. Everyone's changing gear, desperately trying to get into the right rhythm and to maintain their place in the line. The field is drawn out like an accordion because of the pace of the leaders ahead. Cavalcanti looks over his shoulder. Where's Gimondi? There's a seat reserved for him right here. Cavalcanti is Gimondi's most unselfish assistant. Now it's really important to be up front among the leaders before the field breaks up. And that's bound to happen soon, the way Merckx is heaping coals on the fire now. Zilioli. Gimondi. And Pettison. They're all aware something is going to happen soon. For Fuente, the situation is critical. Up front, it's now Schoenmacher's turn and Hussmann's drops back. All the strongest have assembled up front. Now the real climbing starts and the field begins to crack. It's here that the first elimination takes place and the public are well aware of it. They know this is the spot for breakthroughs and breakdowns. pace is grueling among the leaders. Riders get coupled off, one after the other. Fuente loses ground, fouled up by a gear change. And now he's chasing the Merckx group. Merckx himself has taken the lead. But Fuente is closing in on him. Here he overtakes the Olympic champion, Kuiper. And now the Italian veteran, Zilioli. Displaying his brilliant mountaineering style, Fuente continues to close up on Max and company. Francesca Moser is overtaken just as easily. Now he's drawing level with Hoosmans, Merckx's right-hand man, who has lost ground after his long lead earlier on. Fuente changes gear, passes Hoosmans and keeps up the pace. Now he can see the vanguard. A final surge, and he's up there. The opening round of the fight is over. The decisive eliminations have been made, but stiffer gradients are yet to come. There are four in the lead, and the rest are a long way behind. Between the Babotti Mountain and Monte Carpegna, the final and the most feared gradient of the lap, there's a 20-mile stretch of nearly level road. Four in the lead are Schoenmacher, Merckx, Fuente, and Batalin. Fuente's rule is never to take a lead. Young Batalin is the man for that. In his first season as a pro, he's about to confirm his promotion. But Max prefers not to let others set the pace. He still insists on forcing the field. It's a question of not giving Fuente a breathing space and getting him exhausted before Monte Carpegna. That's Max's tactics. He 
sets the pace. He leads in his rhythm. He doesn't let others take the initiative. That's his way of dealing with a mountain specialist and such a temperamental attacker as Fuente. Max himself, well, he seems tireless. His own teammate, Schoenmacher, is the first to get into trouble when they start climbing again. But he's done a good job. The decisive phase has begun. The decisive hardships. Now the going is really painful. And there are only three left. Schoenmacher is left behind. Is Fuente waiting, saving his resources for a breakout further on? Hardly, because Merx is unmerciful. He's torturing his fellow travelers with his unceasing, back-breaking pull in his typical robust style. He's got into a rhythm which forces the others to give all they've got, a pace which makes hanging onto his rear wheel an endurance test, a torment. Bataline takes a lead. There's the timekeeper driving by with the message that the trio now leads the field by three minutes. Mex draws up to Bataline and then increases the pace a knot. Fuente has a hard time keeping up. Fuente has got to yield. That was the death blow. Here we have Fuente, outdistanced. Jose Manuel Fuente, one of the few authentic mountain races in the classical tradition. him, this lap has developed into a martyr's journey, a path of suffering. A spurt in the mountains, Mex in front of Bataline. The penultimate summit is rounded, and from here there's a very steep climb, the last bit of Monte Capena, a gradient of 22%, one in four. The two leading riders, it's a fight for endurance. Each turn of the pedals, every single meter gained, hurts. The most beautiful and the most pathetic pictures to be seen in the sport of cycling deal with superhuman efforts in classical terrain. Max is shaking off his last opponent. Max alone out front. And he continues alone, pumping energy down into the pedals. Alone with his body, his ambition, his rhythm. First over the top of Monte Carpegna. In second place, Bataline, 45 seconds later. And four minutes later, Zilioli. Another minute later, Gimondi, Tesserodona, Mota, Vitossi, and Panizza. Today's loser, Fuente, suffering from painful cramps at the goal line. He got home as number 32 nearly 10 minutes after Merckx. But many other riders besides Fuente had a rough time on Monte Carpegna. Among them, Ole Ritter. It's a bitter day for him, too. He came home as number 29, eight minutes after Merckx. Which means that he's dropped from his place as number four to number 11 on the total count. This also means that he loses his privileges on Bianchi's team. 
He can't call his own race anymore, but must stand by awaiting orders from Jamondi, who's running third. Disappointment looks like this. This is how a cyclist looks when he's lost some of his illusions. At the tail end of the field, we see various activities. The race doctor's consultation. He knows the rider's special complaints. He has been the Giro's official doctor for years. He's a mobile casualty ward, skin clinic, foot clinic, and chemist shop. He also tests for unauthorized stimulants. Here everything is treated on the run. Saddle sores, he's got the remedy. Concentrated vitamins and dextrose tablets are not considered illegal. The cyclist has to take good care of his well-trained organism. At quiet moments like this, roles can be exchanged. Max helps one of his assistants, and he himself gets a helping hand from another team. Relief for swollen feet is another standard item in the doctor's repertoire. And interviews in the wheel are standard items in the daily TV round. Here, Duncelli gets a chance to explain how he fell foul of one of the commissaires. Max is holding a meeting on tactics. He's in the lead, and the pink jersey must be defended. Ole Ritter gets words of advice from his manager, Adorni. Perhaps they're solving a technical problem. Perhaps deciding on a strategic maneuver. mountain lap. The Abruzzi is down in mid-Italy. Before they start climbing, we see a rare feather at the tail end of Max's pink jersey. All are aware that it will be a rough day, and none the better for the weather forecast of storms in the mountains. A battle will take place on the Magelletta mountain, and it's on Magelletta that Ole Ritter forces his way up among the leaders. He has broken out on his own from the flock in an attempt to join a small group of runaways led by Mex and Fuente. A typical situation for Ole Ritter. He has found his own rhythm for the gradient, and now he's working himself up towards the top of the line with grim determination. His positioning is possible because he's made precise calculations of the lie of the land and his own strength. To gain ground on the stiffest gradients is no fool's game. Ritter closes in on the five up front. Number 82, Fuente. Number three, Max's helpmate, Schoenmacher. Number one, Max. Number 66, Panitza. And number 86, Lascano. Ritter has changed to a lower gear to pass number 72, Batalin, in a swift charge. Then, only a few meters further on, Ritter makes contact with the lead group. Schoenmacher is leading for Merckx without yielding an inch of room for the others in the fan, and Ritter must fight to avoid being coupled off again. The wing rider is forced onto the gravel. Ritter slips by on the outside, then runs up alongside Fuente. 
Bratelin is closing up. And Pesaradona too. The fan formation is more obvious in the next group. Here, Drummondi has the lead and makes room for three riders in the fan. One kilometer before the summit of Magelletta, a vanguard has been broken up. Fuente has got away on his own. Max is pursuing him. Next come four men, Schoenmacher, Lascano, Ritter and Batalin. From Lanciano to Benevento, the race moves on through the geographical route. A Giro d'Italia, about halfway round. Benevento, near Naples, is the turning point in the south. The 12th lap to Fiuggi Terme, near Rome, is marked by some of the more anonymous riders who execute a breakaway, and that lasts all the way to the finishing line. But already on the next day, from Fiuggi to Bozena, the principal players try their strength again. Number 82, Fuente attacks. The field is led by Schoenmacher and Batalin. Fuente has gone off to the Poggio Nibio climb. Never tired of challenging Max. Pursuit of Fuente is gathering momentum. Jomondi gains ground, and in front there's Max and his helpmate Ruyere. Fuente is still out on his own in the lead, but now the cars are passing him. A bad sign. Something is happening behind him. It's Max who has left the group behind him, and now he's gaining on Fuente. is alongside. Fuente has company. Max glances backwards, tramps on the pedals, and spurts away from a surprised and defenseless Fuente. That's that. That's how. That's the way to take a mountain spurt and take the mountain specialist for a ride. That's how Max settles that. Next day, it's the Toscana lap to Florence. Number 82 again. The tireless Fuente breaking out. And this time he's across the line a minute before Max. From Florence across to the Mediterranean, Forte dei Marmi. Along towards noon, a shady garden, bits and pieces of a cycle, a table laid with mechanical parts, gear wheels, pedal arms, toe clips, screws, cables, a couple of busy hands, the whole thing pulled to pieces. This is no ordinary day. In a corner of the garden, work is proceeding with this particular cycle. A man occupied with getting a cycle into shape. The hub is removed. Ole Ritter eats by himself. This is no ordinary day. A handful of greasy ball bearings. The cycle's vital parts mustn't fail today. 
A good, solid lunch in peace and quiet. Everything a body needs for nourishment. Today the grease is removed from the bearings. Today nothing must upset him. All resistance is reduced to a minimum. This meal is his hour of solitude. There's time today for the perfect touch. This meal has to be digested in four hours and then his cycle must be ready. It's all part of the ritual which strengthens this man's morale on this particular day. A final touch, a confidential remark. This is the way to exercise the power of coincidence. This is the way to make ready for the trial of truth. Here's the time trials. Contre la montre, facing the stopwatch. The fight against the second's hand. The trial of truth. off and the watch begins to register his time. Thirty-seven kilometers. Each man for himself. Two minute intervals between starts. Each man against the clock and against himself. Here there is only the man and his machine. Here strength, psyche and style are expressed in the most simple way. The trial of truth. It's vitally important to get the right thrust, to find and hold a gliding rhythm. Always the highest possible gear which can be maintained effortlessly. Frequent changes to start with. What matters is to get hold of a harmonious thrust. It's very important to make a sensible start. Dangerous to aim too high by using too high a gear from the start. It's a question of feeling your way, of knowing yourself, of finding the right rhythm just for today, of starting off on the right foot for a long, concentrated and cohesive effort. For others, the finishing line is in sight, is reached. Times are entered up. The results are readjusted. The car is following at the stipulated distance. He knows himself, and he knows pretty well where he has his opponents. But each single time trial is an experiment. Racing the clock is, every single time, a new trial of truth and a fresh challenge. There's no margin for coincidence. Here, the question is, whose day is it today? Here, it's exclusively a job for the strongest and a matter of split-second performance. 
But who among the strong can make a superhuman effort today? Yes, he knows himself. He is no machine. He is absorbed in his race as if it were a work of art. The result will depend on his sense of feeling and his concentration. He knows his so-called normal possibilities. And he knows the feeling of euphoria when his wheels start humming, when limits and contours are erased and the fluid thrust is just right. Energy, but above all, energy under control, the allocation of energy, the ribbon of flat road, the afternoon sun, the front wheel, hands, stomach, breathing, the maximum. Kilometer after kilometer, the promenade at Forte de Marmi, the long straight stretch to the turning point. Spectators shouts urging him on. The side wind is an ever-present opponent, but it cannot break his cadenza. Now nothing can make him lose his steady beat. Cycle and body are a compact unit, smoothly thrusting, meter consuming. He is totally involved in a marvelous integrated effort. He is catching up with the rider who started two minutes before him. It's the Olympic champion, the Dutchman Kuiper. He overtakes him on the inside and continues unfalteringly in his stride. Just like in a dream, this fluid gliding thrust, the revolutions equating time and distance, exertion released from the force of gravity, energy like a classic symbol, pain as an icon. A professional's generosity his evaluation of his own powers, his concept of honor, his sense of duty, his experience, the calculated risks, the significance of the individual effort in a larger perspective, but also the sense of well-being when the machine runs smoothly for the man, when all calculations merge into the ultimate exertion. final 200 meters, 150 meters, 100 meters, 50 meters, across the line. Your tempo? Ole Ritter has made the best time today. The 37 kilometers in 46 minutes and 46 seconds. A magnificent time. Corresponding to an average of nearly 48 kilometers per hour. Right now he's number one. In front of Swartz, Blamink and Patterson. Only Merckx and Jamondi can threaten him now. From the route we hear that Jamondi is making amazing time and now has a better placing than Merckx. This is Lascano crossing the line. He hasn't a chance. There's Gimondi. You can plainly hear that. Gimondi's time, 46 minutes, 23 seconds. 
the best time. And there's Max. Max's time, 46 minutes, 54 seconds. Third best. Ole Ritter was second. On some days, the race nearly comes to a standstill, but the spectators along the route don't mind the wait. Delays of hours beyond the program times are not unusual. On the flat stretches, the heat can smother the riders like an eider down. The pace is reduced to slow motion. No one dreams of breaking out. All they can think of is water, a puncture. A rear wheel should take only 10 to 15 seconds to change. A front wheel faster than that. The mechanic has to be a fast worker, even on a scorching hot day. Here's a water carrier on the job. He's busy, on his way to catch up to the field with cold soft drinks and beer for his comrades. Up there in the field, there's no hurry, and the stars take it easy. While the water carrier still has some distance to cover. He's arrived. First, he's got to find Jamundi, and then the others. The cycle race dawdles along. They only compete to be the first at the water. Or first at the bottles. The van salesmen are treating to free drinks all round. The small inns are stormed and ravaged. They insist it's an honor and a pleasure. The cyclists have been our guests. Il Giro passed by here. In fact, it's against the rules to obtain drinks, except at the official supply points. But thirst is stronger than the rules. The day's list of fines will show whether the officials have been heavy-handed. A water carrier on the job. He may not be the star of the team, but he's a good cyclist. And best of all, he's good at supplying water. A mechanic never has a free moment. Here he's doing his spare time job, handing out lunch bags. Each rider easily spotting his own man. The whole of the field stokes up inside the official supply zone. Each team does its own catering, and no rider is forgotten. There's a place for everything. Preparations for a long, hot day on the road. It's important to have the proper diet. A cyclist burns up a terrific number of calories. There's truth in the proverb, an army marches on its stomach. But there's no knowing when the field will set off at speed. And it's a good time not to have a mouthful. And a bad time to have a puncture. Town buzzes with expectations. 
For a while, a town can feel itself to be the center of enormous interest. The cycle race transforms its streets. But having the fleeting pleasure of a Giro's swift transit does not come free. Towns and cities pay to become points on the race route. To be placed at the end of a lap and to act as host and be the object of the nation's attention for 24 hours is very expensive. Like everywhere else, business is business. The Giro d'Italia is a community festival and a good investment for some. Mr. Torriani, the all-powerful race manager, can plot his race through the whole of Italy like a true emperor. It is the mass media which gives the race its financial attraction. All Italians are glued to their TV sets for 22 days. And the daily bulletins are the summer's best family entertainment. Cyclists as media heroes. That's the foundation on which professional cycle sport is built. Teams from 14 firms participate in the Giro, 140 living advertisements, representing 14 different products, lemonade, hot dogs, lamps, spring mattresses, kitchen elements, beer, ice cream, and, of course, cycles. All the riders receive a salary, and the firms pay all expenses necessary for the team's participation in the Giro. For a cycle team, the yearly budget may well be 175,000 pounds. And what do the riders get out of it? Some of them earn a fortune. Others hardly butter for their bread. It depends entirely on their strength, their popularity, and their job on the team. The best paid cyclist ever is Eddie Merckx. He gets at least 225,000 pounds a year. About a third of that is his guaranteed income from the sausage company, whose name he wears. The rest he earns in start money and prizes. His standard fee for mounting his bike is a thousand pounds a day. Gimondi, they reckon, lies around the 75,000 pound mark. 30,000 pounds from his firm. His starting price is 300 pounds. Fuente doesn't earn as much as that. He's stuck with a poor contract and only gets 120 pounds per start. De Vlamink earns about 18,000 pounds each season. He gets 750 pounds per start. Matalin breaks in eight to 12,000 pounds in this, his debut and first professional season, about the same as Ole Ritter earns. He gets 80 pounds per start. Then there are the lesser known in the field the helpers. They get their wages for helping, not for spectacular riding. Some of them are good at some things, some at other things. Several of them are extremely good and experienced riders. Some do invaluable services for their captains. Others are just good comrades. Verona. It's raining in Verona. Umbrellas, riders in capes, the meeting place before the start of the 18th lap, the Roman arena. The rainy weather is the prelude to the final mountain laps. In the Dolomites, the riders have to cross a number of high passes. The highest is 2,246 meters, called Sima Coppi, in memory of the unforgettable Fausto Coppi. It was on peaks like this that Coppi began his legendary solo breakaways. Up here, the hierarchy is shaken into place. On these steep mountain roads is written the classic chapter in the Giro's history. Here is the setting for heroic feats and for tragic breakdowns. Suffering. A rider may fall and hurt himself badly. But these riders are tough and only the worst falls can make them give up. The doctors provide rapid and effective treatment and then back in the saddle. 
Up at the top of the pass, it's possible to take a breather and change jerseys to prepare for the chilly descent. Temperatures and altitudes have to be accounted for. It's raining in Verona. Soon the Battle of the Dolomites will begin. Two days in the high mountains. Now there's no doubt that Fuente is out for revenge. Max's tactics are characteristic. He splits the field and sets Hussmans up front as locomotive on the first mountain, Monte Bodoni. That's to exhaust the Spaniards and cool down the vengeful Fuente. But no fewer than four Spaniards are clinging to the vanguard, besides Gimondi, Batelin, and De Flaming. Pettersen, Ritter, and Zilioli didn't get on when the train left. Further up, the gradient is now so steep that a press car has broken down. The timekeeper drives ahead. They're making a break up front. It's Lascano, pursued by Fuente. Max himself takes the chase. Fuente and Lascano have shaken off the pursuers. Barely one minute after them, Andra, De Flamenc, Ateline, and Gimondi hanging on to Max. Lascano and Fuente continue their perfect teamwork. None of the pursuers fancies relieving Max. Giomondi thinks only of keeping his position as number two against the upstart, Batelin. Fuente and Lascano go all out to establish an advantage which can't be taken from them when the road goes downwards again. Max gives a sign. He wants to contact the team card. To get another cycle ready. The dirt road is muddy and difficult to ride. Max hardens the chase here. He's leading all the time in his robust, imperturbable style. Spaniards lose ground before the summit is reached. On the plateau at the top of the pass, the pursuers can see the two fugitives and they catch them on the way down. At the foot of Paganella, the second mountain of the day, the leading group is grown to nine men. Five of these are Spaniards. But now Mex takes over the command. Goes out in front, sets the tempo up. Now, on a new climb, it looks as though Merckx will force a decision. The pedals must be pushed to the limit if you're not to be left behind. Gimondi passes Fuente and takes over his place at Merckx's rear wheel. Batalin, Lascano, Fuente, Zilioli, Goldos, Adja, Pesaradona.
turns on and on. That's his way of dealing with the climbs. He doesn't use Fuente's sudden accelerations. But he has a tough, uniform march rhythm that has the effect of slowly torturing the others. Gimondi keeps glued on to his rear wheel, but it's a murderous pace. The leading group is at breaking point. It's hard to keep up. Especially for the Spaniards, they're feeling the pinch. To increase the pace now, it's surely impossible. Inhuman or any other than Eddie Merckx. Merckx is 50 meters in front of Gimondi and Batalin, and 100 meters in front of Fuente. Batalin tries to take Gimondi by surprise. It doesn't work. And Jamondi immediately rides up alongside his young rival. A little further back, Galdos and Fuente are fighting to limit their distance. Max continues on his own. He's playing his trump card, even though it's not really necessary. Behind him, there's a battle between generations. It's important for Felice Gimondi to put young Batalin in his place. Gimondi must prove that he's still Italy's campionissimo. Adorni rides up and tells them that now they are gaining on Mex. Gimondi takes some tough spurts in an attempt to break Batalin. Mex crosses the line in the small mountain town of Andalo. And only 40 seconds later, Gimondi spurts past into second place. Gimondi has good reason to be satisfied with his effort. The same may be said for Batalin. Gimondi turns to look for the others. It wasn't Fuente's day today, after all. His offensive misfired. Gimondi's defensive tactics were successful. Fuente, worn out and disappointed, but admired for his courage. Ule Ritter, worn out, but not dissatisfied. He pulled up well on the last mountain. And tomorrow there's another day in the Dolomites. Tomorrow the drama continues in the high mountains. The tired heroes need to rest. At the hotel, Jamondi has trouble with his lungs. An old complaint, which always recurs in the mountains. A rider in top form often has problems with his condition. When you're trained to top form, illness strikes easily if you're not careful. That's why the riders are examined every day, morning and night. <coughs> Vuoi fare il grano? Vuoi fare il 
se vuoi puoi fare anche la bottiglia, ma no, no, per te è meglio, trovi meglio. The rider's body is marked by his occupation. 14, Take Ole Ritter. His pulse is abnormally low. Down to 28 to 30 at rest, compared to the normal rate of 60 to 70. On the massage couch, hard muscles are loosened up. The body relaxes. An interval for afterthought. And for a welcome break. The events of the day are put to rights. The team gets together. Guarda, non c'ho più niente che funzioni, né per niente né la radio. Io non bene, io e sarei in testa e tutti volevano andare via. Giusto che la mia Ho detto, tu stai calmo. Se io dico che tu vinci la classifica dei tricolori. Chi vince il tricolore? Due maiali. Due maiali. Ten riders and their trainer. No one else must eat at the same table. The other ranks, the mechanics, the masseurs, and the doctor, eat apart. There's no one as hungry as a cyclist. No one else with a similar calorie turnover. On a single tough lap, a rider loses up to seven or eight pounds. The communal meal keeps up the team morale, the sense of being together. Cassio. And the communal meal is also for planning tactics. Here they discuss developments in the race so far, the possibilities for the next day, and the tasks for each rider. The lay of the land on the next lap is reviewed and inevitably they try to guess the plans of their opponents. When is the next chance of a lap victory for the team? <laughs> Felice Gimondi is the star. They're banking on his position. The others are riding for him, and if needs be, to sacrifice themselves for him. Ole Ritter is his lieutenant and right-hand man, and Ritter himself is one of the elite. An early bird. For him, the day starts at 5 a.m. The cycle mechanic. It's his love and care that supports the shining machines. The team cycles are divided between two mechanics, each with his own responsibilities. New tape on the handlebars. Old glue is scraped off the rims. The wheels are put in trim. Spokes tightened. Alignment adjusted. A racing bike is a delicate and precise instrument subjected daily to maximum strains. A professional rider needs perfect equipment each day. The mechanic's expertise and efficiency is the basis for a good job on the road. That's why they have a working day of 15 hours. A set of newly laundered jerseys hung up to dry. A set of bikes taken under expert treatment. One hour before the start, the usual scene outside the team's hotel. Gimondi and Basso fans want pictures of their idols. The team maunders along through the town. A slow cycle tour. Stretching. Warming up muscles already softened by the morning massage. Professional sportsmen on their way to work.
It's their job to ride a bike. Some of them are better than others. Some make a much better living from it. There are different sized ambitions. Some have lost their illusions. Some aspire higher. Some are modest. But they are all professionals. They know what they've chosen and what they can do. Each man with his special qualities. Each man has his own role to play and plays it more or less well, more or less wholeheartedly. Here is another team preparing for the start. The police escort, who accompany the riders right through the race. Their job is to clear the road for the race, to protect the riders from other traffic. They are experts in cycle racing and they like their job. No wonder they're a popular team in Italy. Ten professional riders who have a job to do together. Actors in classical surroundings, participating in a ritual play of great beauty. The ingredients are old-fashioned virtues, bravery, stamina, sacrifice, courage, honor, pride. Here is the start, the square in the little town. Here they meet their comrades from the other team. Here they sign on for the day's work. Franco Mori, della Bianchi Campagnolo. Michelotto, della Bianchi Campagnolo. Rodriguez, Bianchi Campagnolo. Firma Conati, neo professionista. Firma Simonti, campione d'Italia. Ritter, della Bianchi Campagnolo. Galdos. Attenzione Simondi, posa col quadro del pittore Vincenzo Napoli che verrà consegnato al giornalista Sconcerti. Ibene, Cassa, Ecco, Guarazzini, Spinelli da Carmignano, Gilson, il lussemburghese della Rocado. Grande della Cassa. Diamo la firma ragazzi. Ecco Josta Peterson, Marchetti, quello di prima era Giuliani. Ecco Josta Peterson, della squadra. Another town, another day, before the start of a new lap. The roll call for the contestants in the race. The same names. Signing on again. The ritual is repeated. Another day, another town. The scenery changes. The actors are identical. The props identical. Details to be seen to. Criticism to be digested. Another town. Another day. A new point of departure. A team at ease, waiting for the start. The usual minutes before the takeoff. The usual preparations. The whole field at the ready. La 
The field gathers together. The procession sets off. Goodbye to that town, that square. The escort cars get into position. The field starts moving and slowly exits the scene. Goodbye to that scene, goodbye to that town. The ritual is repeated. The race is starting. The actors give new performances. The race moves on again. Out to a new set where the play may proceed. past other audiences. Out here, roles may be clearly distinguished. Some are brave, some show stamina, some sacrifice, some are cunning. Others, anonymous, but competent. The rivalry is unchanged. The alliances continue, and the play develops and changes. Some have a better day than others. Some may get an unexpected chance. Each lap has its own unpremeditated story. Each day, loyalty to the team is challenged by individual ambition. To be a professional rider is a question of finding a solution to the conflict between ambition and loyalty. second day in the Dolomites, the penultimate day of the race. The lap is 210 kilometers long and is routed over four passes. From here, the goal is 110 kilometers away. The Spaniard, Lascano, breaks out. And right after him, Farasato and Fuente. The trio quickly draws out ahead, but the field puts on speed. The Spanish offensive was expected, but not so early in the day. Up front, the situation is changed. Fuente has gone on alone in the lead. He has a 50 meters lead on Farisato. Having initiated the breakout for his countrymen, Lascano has fallen back. The field is led, as usual, by Max's men. Here it's Schoenmacher and Van Schill. Fuente continues his solo with determination under the watchful eye of the TV camera. He looks back. Well, he made a good start and the one-man show can go on. But isn't he taking a big risk? Isn't it far too early to go off on his own? Hasn't he learnt that he shouldn't bargain with his resources and his temperament? Fuente is barely two minutes ahead of the field when he descends from the first pass. The question is whether he can maintain his lead on the way down. Normally, Fuente is not a striking downhiller. He usually loses on the round and downs what he gained on the ascents.
it's important for him to reach the next climb with a fairly comfortable lead. The field is on its way down, hunting the fugitive. After the first pass, the field is still together. Down in the valley, Fuente keeps his lead, and now it's soon time to climb again. Half a minute after in the field led by Schoenmacher. And here, a few kilometers farther on, in a town at the foot of the mountain, Colle San Lucia, the field starts out on the climb, goes into the first hairpin bend. A few coils farther up, Fuente has got into his gliding climbing thrust and is beginning to increase the distance from the field below, which is still intact. Now it's Hussman's turn as the pacemaker. The pace set by the Belgian is making its mark. Soon the weeding out begins, the elimination. Fuente thrusts on steadily, apparently without effort in a very high gear. That's how he takes a bend, without losing his beat. And there's Farasato, who helped in beginning the breakout, still placed between Fuente and the field, riding unexpectedly well, two miles from Colle San Lucia. But it's a long way home for a little man alone in a mountain trip. 60 kilometers to go, with pass altitudes of nearly 2,000 meters. He has a lead of a good couple of minutes. Hussmans is still pulling his weight, followed by Merckx, Batalin, Pesaradona, Gimondi, Panitza, Lascano. The strong men have taken their positions up front, but Fuente shows no signs of weakening. Is this crazy and magnificent project of his really going to succeed? Or is he going to pay the terrible price for his foolhardiness? Fuente's mad, the others say. At any rate, he's the anarchist among them. <laughs> 